Welcome to the last part of Lecture 5. In the previous part, what we looked at was a new technique, that of capillary breakup extension areometry. We motivated the need for this technique by saying that, look, for complex fluids, fluids with structure or fluids with polymers embedded within them, the extensional flow field can change the structure of the fluid. And so you end up with a different fluid in effect than you would if you just sheared it. And so we can't infer necessarily the full nature of the extensional response of the fluid just by looking at shear data alone. And so the particular technique, capillary breakup extensional rheometry, looked at forming a fluid filament and then monitoring the decay of that fluid filament driven by surface tension over time. The decay driven by surface tension is resisted by stresses within the fluid. Residual stresses due to viscoelasticity, if we have a viscoelastic fluid, or just viscosity, if we have a Newtonian fluid. We saw that, unfortunately, processing the data to get rheological parameters is a data fitting exercise. There are a number of standard forms of filament diameter decay in the literature, and we have to see which one works best for the fluid that we're trying to investigate. However, what I'd like to do is to give you some insight into where these expressions come from and how you derive them. So we're going to look at how we derive the filament thinning expression for a Newtonian fluid. So it all starts with a stress balance. On the blackboard in front of you, you have a cartoon image of a fluid filament. The first assumption we're going to make is our fluid filament is cylindrical and infinitely long. And so that side view, we can see just a portion of the fluid filament. It's a cylinder. We've got the z-axis in our cylindrical coordinate system pointing along the length of that cylinder. In section, what we have is a schematic diagram of what's happening due to surface tension. We need to consider very carefully the stresses in this system, and surface tension is the key source of stress. We're going to assume that in this infinitely long fluid cylinder, all the axial stresses, sigma zz, have decayed to zero. You could imagine as you stretch that fluid filament, you are indeed going to have axial stress. But once you stop stretching the fluid filament and let it thin under surface tension alone, those axial stresses are assumed to have decayed to zero for our Newtonian case. Remember that the state of stress in a Newtonian fluid is instantaneously linked to the rate of deformation, and once we have finished deforming our fluid axially, the axial stress will be zero. If we consider the circumferential stresses, there is nothing causing deformation in a circumferential direction. There is no rotation. Our circumferential stress featured in our rotational flows, but this is irrotational by very definition of it being elongational, purely elongational. The only stress we have is radial. In that section view, I have drawn the forces that result within the fluid from the action of surface tension. Surface tension, if you like, is a little bit like a big elastic band wrapped around the outer edge of that fluid, the outer periphery. And so whilst that elastic band acts with a hoop stress, if we were to cut it, it would retract in a theta direction, the net result of that squeezing is a radial stress. Imagine that you're squeezing on a um, cylinder of plasticine, like so, what happens? It elongates as you form that radial stress within the cross section of the fluid. And we can relate what that radial stress is when we consider the value of surface tension. So we have the capillary force minus two alpha, alpha is our surface tension, divided by diameter. And so we can see that our radial stress increases significantly as our diameter decreases. Now, the range of surface tension values for real fluids is actually quite small, from maybe as low as 0 0.18, 0 0.19 newtons per metre for something like silicon oil, through to 0.72 for water, maybe up to oh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3-ish for molten metals. However, we don't usually come across molten metals, and we certainly don't play with mercury anymore in the way that we used to. So, sigma RR is the stress that is present due to surface tension. That's the stress that we know the value of. Okay, so let's set up a stress balance. 
on the board in front of you is a reminder of some of the tensor relationships we derived in the first lectures of this section. Sigma here is our total stress, all the stress that is present in the system. And if you think back to that lecture when we introduced this equation, we could say that it's a sum of two parts. It's a sum of the hydrostatic pressure, acting equally in all directions, minus P times the identity tensor, P is scalar, plus the stress due to deformation. In this case, we're looking at a Newtonian fluid, and so the stress due to deformation is simply eta times gamma dot, where gamma dot is my rate of strain tensor. So, we know that the total stress for our fluid is non-zero in the radial direction, but zero in the zz direction and the theta theta direction. So let's set up the stress balance in these directions. Let's start in the direction where we have our non-zero stress. So sigma rr is our radial direction normal stress, and that's going to be minus p plus eta gamma dot rr. We know that the value of sigma rr is set by surface tension squeezing, and that's equal to minus 2 alpha over d. So rearranging this relationship gives us a value for the unknown hydrostatic pressure p, which is going to be related to both the surface tension and to the radial deformation rate gamma dot rr. OK, so let's remember that result. Let's call that result a. Now let's look at stress in a different direction. Let's look in the axial direction, the axial normal stress, sigma zz. That again is going to be equal to the hydrostatic pressure P plus eta gamma dot zz, the rate of deformation in the axial direction, it's the elongation rate. And we know that's equal to zero. If we substitute our result for hydrostatic pressure in A, we can rewrite sigma zz now as a function of sigma rr and sigma zz. In green there is a result from A. Now, think of the kind of deformation we're imposing on the fluid. We've stretched it uniaxially. This is a uniaxial elongation and again if you think back to earlier lectures we know how to relate the rates of deformation in the principal directions for a uniaxial extension. In particular what you will hopefully remember is that gamma dot rr, which is the rate of deformation in the direction we're not stretching it, is equal to minus gamma dot zz over 2, which was the direction in which we stretched. So if we remember the fact that we have a uniaxial deformation, we can rewrite that axial direction principal stress all in terms of just one deformation rate. And we could choose sigma gamma dot rr or gamma dot zz, but at this point it's wise to remember where we're heading with this derivation. What we want to evaluate is diameter decay. So having an expression that's entirely posed in terms of gamma dot rr is actually very, very useful. So that's what we're going to do on the next slide. So we're going to think about what gamma dot rr means now. What is gamma dot rr, and how do we relate this to diameter decay? When we look at the components of the rate of strain tensor, in pure elongation, gamma dot rr is simply 2 times dvr by dr, by definition. Remember, it's a factor 2 because you've got the grad v plus the grad v transpose, and on the principal diagonal, the terms are the same in the non-transpose and the transpose form, and so when you add the two together, you simply end up with twice the value of whatever the original term was on the principal diagonal. So gamma dot rr is 2 times dv by dr. And if we think about changing this in terms of diameter rather than radius, we know that a diameter is twice a radius. So we can derive the fact that dvr by dd needs a factor 4 preceding it because diameter is twice radius. So gamma dot rr has now been rewritten in terms of a partial differential with respect to diameter. Now let's think about radial velocity carefully. What is my radial velocity? Well, it's the rate of change of radius with respect to time, which is half the rate of change of the diameter with respect to time because it's coming in from two sides. So vr is the rate of change of radius with respect to time. So if we substitute that expression for radial velocity into the partial differential on the line above, we can see that gamma dot rr 
equals 2 partial d by partial d of partial d by partial t. So, let's rearrange this and let's integrate. So, I'm going to, on the left hand side, have a term that is with respect to diameter. So, dd is the subject of the integration. And the limits are going from 0 to d. Now, on the right hand side, we have the integral of the terms including dd by dt, and we're going from 0 to dd by dt. So if we integrate this, we end up with an expression for dd by dt now as a function of gamma dot rr and d. And we can see that if we can substitute a form of gamma dot rr in that involves d, we should be able to obtain an expression for diameter decay as a function of time. Let's call this intermediate result c. And now on the board, let's start putting these results together. So in the yellow box on the left hand side, we have dd by dt related to gamma dot rr and diameter. And on the right hand side, in the green, we have an expression for gamma dot rr as a function of diameter and surface tension alpha. So let's substitute one into the other. Uh, here we have dd by dt now, rewritten as d over 2 from c and in green the contribution from surface tension in B. Let's integrate. So if we think about the integration limits, our diameter of our filament starts at D0 and after an arbitrary time it's gone to diameter D. And we're defining our time to start when our diameter is at D0 and it's got to little t, arbitrary time little t, when we've got arbitrary diameter big D. So let's integrate this, and we end up with that d over d0, that's our normalised diameter, is linear with respect to time. It's 1 minus alpha surface tension times t, divided by 3 times viscosity times d0 original diameter. Great. OK, so that's how we get an expression from theory from for diameter decay. And we could use a very similar workflow for more complex rheological constitutive equations like a Maxwell or a Giesecus, which is exactly how the Maxwell and the Giesecus results are derived. Now, let's revisit our assumptions and think carefully about whether or not they're valid for real rheometric systems. So on the board now, we have a statement of something that is very important. Real systems aren't infinitely long cylinders, which was the key assumption that underpinned the analysis that we've just done. Real systems are like that illustrated in blue, sort of hourglass shaped. And the filament, the middle section of the hourglass, is actually short, usually, compared to the two fluid reservoirs on the upper and lower piston. So we need to think how we correct the expression that we've obtained for an infinitely long cylinder to that for a real rheological situation. And this is where our shape factor x comes in. There's some theory that we're not going to go through now that derives how we get x and how we derive values for x. You can look in the literature to find those if you're interested. But the key thing is that x modifies the numerator of the expression that involves time. So we have that 2x minus 1 term. Of practical use, however, are values of x for various flows. So an infinitely long cylinder, clearly x equals 1. Can we get back to the relationship that we just derived? For the type of hourglass shape that we see in pretty much most practical rheological situations, x is 0.7127. That's the Eggers solution, and it comes from a fairly complex piece of analysis. So let's see how well a set of extensional rheological data can obtain material parameters. So what we're going to do is to examine a fluid of known rheology. Let's say that we use a standard, a viscosity standard. It's Newtonian, it's a silicon oil, and we know by rotational rheometry that its viscosity is 1.0 pascal second. Let's say we perform a capillary breakup experiment with it, that nice uniaxial elongation, measuring diameter decay. And here on this graph is a plot of our normalised filament diameter, d over d0, as a function of time in milliseconds. So it's quite a fast rate of decay, under a second. The first thing we can see 
if the relationship is linear. This is good. We would expect there to be a linear relationship for a Newtonian fluid. So let's introduce some values from the experiment for the viscosity evaluation. D0 in this case was 440 microns. So this gives you a feel for the type of optics that are needed to resolve the filament decay. If we start at 440 microns and we go down to D over D0 of 0.05, you need some very good zoom lenses. Surface tension for silicon oil is very, very low. It's 0.018 newtons per meter, so 0.18 millinewtons per meter. The filament that we form when we look at the videos is symmetric. This is good. The filament has to be symmetric above and below and along its axis. It's very easy to make an asymmetric filament, and that's how experimental error can so easily creep into these capillary breakup experiments. We have a symmetric filament and it's hourglass shaped. So we know that our shape factor x is 0.7127. We furthermore know that for a Newtonian fluid, our rate of diameter decay can be written as there in blue on the board, and that's the expression that we've just derived. So if we work this through, what do we get eta to be? 1.06 pascal second, which is very, very close to our one pascal second that we measured with rotational rheometry, which is a relief. So we have consistency, self-consistency between these experiments. So let's recap a couple of key points. We've derived an expression that allows us to calculate the viscosity of a Newtonian fluid when subject to an extensional flow. And we've seen that it resolves from a stress balance. We've used the tensor expressions that we developed in lecture one. We had sigma RR being non-zero and sigma ZZ being zero. We assumed an infinitely long filament, and then we proceeded with a stress balance related stresses to deformation rates, recognized the presence of a uniaxial deformation, recognized what our radial um, expression for uh, gamma dot was in terms of velocity, in terms of velocity change with diameter, and then arrived at an expression that we needed to correct for the real situation being not an infinitely long cylinder. And we've finally seen as well that careful experimentation, very careful experimentation, can yield good quality data for rheological parameters with capillary breakup extensional rheometry.